Step one, take a hammer to the bathroom scale. Step two, rip up all the diet rule books. And step three, get ready to redefine what health and well being means to you. And guess what? It's not your weight, it's not your shape, and it's not how much space you take up. Welcome to Body Kindness. I'm Rebecca Scritchfield. I'm the author of the book, Body Kindness, and host for this podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. I ask that you keep an open mind as we have interesting conversations about what it means in this culture to resist and reject and divest from the norms of health is only for people who are pursuing thinness and weight loss and dieting. We can say no to that. That does not help many people create a better life. But through this show and our conversations, I am confident that you will find your own meaningful path to a happier and healthier life. Even if you want things to change, that's okay. But we have a whole lot of unlearning to do, and I invite you to join me on the unlearning. Going down, clown. Well, you just heard me having a scale smash party. That is actual audio from me smashing a stack of scales in front of a group of friends. And didn't it sound like a lot of fun? So if you want to learn more about how you can break up with the scale, and yes, I mean that attachment to the specific number, but I also mean the other scales that we use to measure ourselves. It could be attachment to certain ways of eating. It could be attachment to smaller clothes. It could be the fantasies we have in our minds about the way life should be right now, rather than thinking about how to be good to ourselves and make changes with a sense of self-compassion instead of shame. So free summer challenge all summer long, bodykindnessbook.com slash scale smash. And I'm going to help you out with some interesting reflective prompts and motivation and inspiration. And I really hope to see pictures and videos of you smashing your scale too. My topic today is the intersection of body image and sexual health. My special guest to discuss this is Peggy Orenstein. Peggy is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, Girls and Sex, Navigating the Complicated New Landscape, and Cinderella Ate My Daughter, and a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine. Welcome to the show, Peggy. I'm so excited to have you here. I've read both your books. Uh, Watch your TED Talk. It's all amazing. Um, I highly encourage all the listeners to dive right in, Um, but many already know and are familiar with your work, and I'm really excited to toss some questions your way today. But just to get started, for those who might not be as familiar, can you tell me a little bit um, about yourself and your work? Oh, uh, well... I'm a journalist, and I've been writing about girls' and women's issues for, oh, almost 25 years now. And uh, the two books that you're talking about, I've written five altogether, but the two in particular are sort of a, a duo, I think, in a certain way, although I hadn't initially seen them that way. That girls, and I'm, I'm sorry, Cinderella Ate My Daughter looks at the way that um, the pink and pretty culture of little girlhood or what I started calling the princess industrial complex um, markets to girls from the very earliest ages, the idea that how they look is more important than who they are and teaches them to be that they're, that being desirable is more important than their own desire. And so it sort of seemed a natural outgrowth then to move to. So what, you know, what, what happens down the line when that pink and pretty culture moves to the idea of selling hot and disconnects girls from their authentic internal sexual feelings. What does that mean in terms of their sex lives as they get older? And yes. let's receive that. 
Yeah. Well, I'm grateful for both of your books because I have two girls and they're they're very young. One is two and a half and one is four. Uh, but the first time I heard you speak was actually, it must have been several years ago at this point, but it's actually at the Renfrew Conference in Philadelphia. It was an eating disorder conference. And you were you spoke about Cinderella Ate My Daughter. And it was just, it was the first time I heard things like about that pink used to be the boy color because it was a softer version of red. And I remember I was just wow. And it really, I guess I just learned to accept things like, oh, here are the girl Legos that are pink. (laughs) And, you know, they're all about um, shopping and painting your nails. And so it was so interesting to see that before kids and then watch my kids come out. And just so you know, you know, what kind of difference you're making. I was fully committed in my registry as like, gender neutral and I'm getting the boy legos darn it you know like everything I could to just sort of you know actually my older daughter she does like pink um but we talk about if there's an opportunity if she says something like blue is a boy color or green is a boy color her her grandma will say well green is my favorite color and we just sit in gentle ways open up her mind and give her these ideas that eh, you don't really need to kind of fall for it so that's just a personal Thank you for that. And when I saw Girls and Sex, I was like, yes, I don't need it yet, but I will. (laughs) And a lot of the listeners of the podcast and readers of Body Kindness, I mean, this is a really, um, you know, like a really key issue that they're still dealing with as adults, this idea of how, you know, body image issues may have gotten in the way of them really stepping into their full sexual health and their full potential. And they're still, you know, it's around 80 some percent of women struggle with body image issues. And it, it dawned on me in my counseling experience, you know, that I was like, wow, you know, I bet I could start to learn that some of the clients who dealt with eating disorders and body image issues just kind of felt like, well, why would I want to give my body any amount of pleasure at all? And that just got me personally interested in looking at my own past And um, just being willing, you know, to kind of talk more openly in my book and in my counseling and with people about like, yes, part of our well-being is our sexual health. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I put it in terms of in the book, uh, I use a phrase that was coined by Sarah McLellan, who's a psychologist at the University of Michigan that I mean, it's my favorite phrase. It puts it. she, She calls it intimate justice. So it's in the social justice framework. And intimate justice is this idea that sex has political as well as personal implications, just like who does the dishes in your home or who vacuums the rug. And it brings up similar issues of inequality, economic disparity, violence, physical and mental well-being. And intimate justice encourages us to ask who's entitled to engage in a sexual behavior, who's entitled to enjoy it, who's the primary beneficiary. And how does each partner define good enough? And yeah, frankly, I think that those are tricky and sometimes traumatic questions for adult women to confront. But when we're talking about girls and their early sexual experiences, I just kept coming back to this idea that I didn't want those experiences to be something they had to get over. Mm. You mean getting over negative sexual experiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so hopefully the girls are actually reading it themselves if the parents aren't reading it to help um, both, I think would be nice. I personally thought Girls and Sex was a fascinating read for even if you don't have girls, right? I think we need to parent our boys too, just as much. And even for people who don't have kids, if kids or teens look up to you, I think if you're an adult wondering, what can I do? First of all, you don't need to be at your best self to help others, but work on yourself because that's going to help you help others. But it, it's an area we all need to educate ourselves in and, and have some type of appropriate conversation. I couldn't believe it when I read in your book, you interviewed, I think it was 70 girls and only two, one, two, like, you know, two had a meaningful conversations with their fathers about sex. Is that accurate? Yep, that's right. And, you know, I'm actually now talking to boys and I'm finding pretty much the same thing that if they talk about it, they're talking to their moms. But one part of the book that, you know, I did a section on um, questioning the notion of the meaning of virginity. And and as part of that, I went down to a purity ball, which is a ritual in which uh, it's usually evangelicals and uh, the, the 
it's like a kind of like a debutante ball where the fathers bring the daughters and they the daughters um, promise to remain pure until they enter a biblical marriage. And so it's it's you know it's a purity ball. And you would expect somebody like me, you know, a, a feminist, uh, all these things, you know, go, to go down there and just like slam the heck out of that thing. But that wouldn't be very interesting, really, um, as a writer or as a thinker. So when I do when I do something like that, and there's a similar chapter in Cinderella where I go down to a beauty pageant and look at not only what is objectionable and obviously based on evidence ineffective in these things or or harmful in these rituals, but what surprises me about them. And with the purity ball, I found myself, you know, watching this sort of crazy thing weirdly moved. And it was because it was the only place in all of my reporting where I saw fathers of teenage girls standing up, expressing support, expressing love, and having a discussion about their values around physical and emotional intimacy. And even though I didn't like the content of that discussion, and that it was demonstrably ineffective to harmful, depending on the situation for the girl, it was still a place where they were doing that. And I never saw that when I was outside of that realm. So that was something I felt that those of us who have a different perspective on physical and emotional intimacy, you know, who don't necessarily believe in waiting until marriage to be physically and emotionally intimate could learn from that community. Yeah, no, it was a very powerful story. Did did you get any data on if girls spoke to their mothers, like that maybe that too would have increased a little bit more? Yeah, they do talk to their mothers more, um, for sure. But there's a, still a gap. Well, yes, A, there's a gap. And B, you know, one of the things, and this is sort of skipping way ahead, but one of the things that became clear was that the when mothers talk to their daughters, we tend to focus on risk and danger exclusively, and that that is really only having half of a conversation with them. Um, and, and what I talk about towards the end of the book is um, the model of the Dutch. And that there was a study in particular of, I mean, you know, like, like we said earlier, the book is really the voices of these girls, but there's a lot of research involved too. And one of the things I looked at was a study that compared 400 randomly chosen girls from two demographically similar universities in Holland and the U.S. And it found, and they were talking about their early sexual experiences, and it found that in every way the Dutch girls came out ahead, whether it was fewer negative consequences like pregnancy, disease, being drunk during sex, more positive consequences like knowing their partner very well, being able to communicate with their partner, preparing responsibly, enjoying the experience. And when they talked to the Dutch girls, I mean, really, it made you want to buy wooden shoes. And <laughs> when you went, when they went and talked to the Dutch girls, they found that they, they said that from an early age, their teachers, doctors, and parents talked to them about early and often about sex, sexual pleasure, and the importance of mutual trust and caring in their relationships. And it wasn't so much that American parents were less willing uh, to talk about sex. It was, again, that we talked about it in terms of risk and danger. And the Dutch parents talked about balancing responsibility with joy. And that shift for me was really profound because I'm a parent of a middle school daughter. And I know had I not looked into that research, that I would have talked to her about contraception, disease protection, and consent, because I'm a very modern mom, and I would have thought, job well done. And now I know that that's not nearly enough, and there's a different conversation that we need to be having that's maybe harder for an American parent to get to, but really rewarding once you open those doors. Yeah, I mean, my experience, I mean, there was no conversation at all with my family. And I think that I remember one of my best friends, we're still friends to this day, you know, however, maybe some sort of side snarkety comment about masturbation came up. It was like, ooh, that's gross. That's dirty. So that was just put in there. So it just became even more of a way of disconnecting to my body. And so that was, you know, part of the teen years. And all of a sudden, one day I found out everyone was having sex while I was studying. I was like, wait, what's up? So then I felt behind. And so it was, yeah, I mean, it's, I think I feel personally committed to like breaking the chain or fixing it for, for my girls, because I do feel that in a lot of ways, 
that, you know, my family didn't know what they needed to know to help and culture certainly didn't help at all. You know, because if you think about it, we aren't born thinking what we think about sex in our bodies, you know, and how you just compare the two cultures. American culture conditions us differently. And, you know, so in, in body kindness, I generally call out, you know, that diet culture is responsible for making us feel that our bodies aren't good enough. And, you know, there's, I guess, a sexuality culture, right, that defines this is what women's bodies are for, and it's to make somebody else happy. It's not to teach us to make our bodies happy. What we see is, you know, we live in a hyper-sexualized culture that's simultaneously absolutely silent about healthy, healthy sexual relationships for young people. So it's very confusing for them. And one of the things I talk about, and this is something we can correct as parents, in this whole intimate justice, you know, context of who gets to engage, who gets to enjoy, who gets, to, who's the primary beneficiary, how we define good enough. And and I will say that one of the main findings was that young women today did feel entitled to engage in sexual behavior, but not necessarily entitled to enjoy it. And one of the things that I talk about is that I think relates to what you were saying a minute ago is what I called the American psychological clitoridectomy. And what I mean by that is that when we have our children, parents have a tendency to name all their baby boys body parts. So they'll at least say, here's your pee pee. You know, they'll say something. But when we talk about girls' bodies, when they're infants, we tend to go right from navels to knee, navel to knees and leave that whole, you know, situation in there, like unnamed. And then they go into puberty education and they learn that boys have erections and ejaculations and girls have periods and unwanted pregnancy. <laughs> They're not the same. And they see that, you know, that internal thing that looks like the steer's head looking thing that looks like a Georgia O'Keeffe painting. And it grays out between the legs. So we never say vulva. We never say clitoris. Back to your point earlier, fewer than half of girls age 14 to 17 have ever masturbated. And then they go into their partner experience and we expect that somehow they're going to think that it's about them, that they're going to have a voice, that they're going to be able to articulate their needs, their desires, their wants, their limits, or even know what those might be and have those respected. You know, we set them up. We set them up for inequality. It's really, you know, not good enough for a young woman like you to think, oh, everybody's having sex. I better too. That is not liberation. That is more disconnection from our bodies. And and I really think it's around these issues for women of hunger. You know, sexuality is also about hunger. It's about desire. It's about want. It's about understanding your body. It's about pleasure. All those things are things that we deny women, whether we're talking about food, whether we're talking about sexuality. And instead, we put all the judgment and all the I don't know, it's not exactly pleasure, but all the value, I guess, in somebody else's hands. So the the question I had for you, but I I also have a guess. And so the question is, like, why are women still faking orgasms? And just hearing you talk, I feel like my guess is it's like another way we must be broken. But what are your thoughts on that? I love that you use the word broken because there's this fantastic book. And and there's a TED Talk if you don't want to read a whole book. You should buy the book. Um, called Come As You Are by Emily Nagas. And one of the things that she is really talking about, she she's a um, professor and she was teaching at Indiana University. She's a, she, uh, a teaching a course on human sexuality or something. And she found that over and over in the feedback at the end of the semester, what she got back from her female students was the main thing they, she'd say, what is the main thing you're taking away from this class? And they'd say that I'm not broken. You know, I mean, they, they would say things like, I thought I was born without a clitoris or you know, like various things. And it was so, and she said it made her, she would sit in her office and cry. And she had to write this book to explain the way female sexuality works so that we would know we were not inadequate. We were not broken. We were not lesser than it was, you know, it was that our whole approach and learning about sexuality was wrong. Not that we were, but, you know, I think that the faking orgasm thing, what's interesting is that the rates among college students have actually gone up since the 1990s. So based on surveys. So that is something that is getting more intense. And I think there's a lot of reasons, you know, I think some of it is porn culture. I think some of it is that girls will tell me that, well, you know, he's trying so hard and I don't want to hurt his feelings. Um, Some of it is, is just performance, you know, that they think they're performing orgasm, just like they're performing sexiness, performing sexuality. So there's a lot of things going on. Some of it is that they, you know, they want guys to think they're cool, whatever. But it's not about their bodies. And I did have one young woman who had told me she was a junior in college at this point, And she had given me sort of a long, we'd had a long talk 
um, about her sexual history and her her sense of empowerment in the classroom and her empowerment in her I, her professional goals and all of this and her complete disempowerment in her body and these one-off hookups she'd been having since she was 13. And she said that just recently she realized she had to stop faking orgasm because the way that she put it was, I'm not doing other girls any favors by letting these guys mm-hmm. think that this is, you know, that what they're doing is working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'll be done with this guy, but then he's going to move on to the next poor soul who, and be a disappointing yeah. It's her duty yeah. To, to change. And I thought, okay, well, if that's what it takes, you know? Yeah. Well, I, through, through you, I did show my girl, you know, early on by two-year-old baths, you know, they were discovering that they had something going on between the knees and navel. And, and I said, this is the vulva, you know, and then, you know, basically inside where pee comes out, that's called vagina. And so they know that there's, I mean, they're young, that they know there's two parts. And I just included it with, where's your head? Where's your eyes? And just in the most neutral, it embarrasses my husband, but he, he gets it. So he knows enough to support me. And I'm just kind of you hearing. Tell them what their elbow was. <laughs> you know, like, did you ever allow your child just let's just not say the word elbow ever? You know, we better not say elbow. She might bump it on something. You know, it's just ridiculous. Um, it, and also, we know that as you, since you have gr- children that age, yeah. you know, they masturbate a lot when they're that age, right? Yeah. They're always figuring out something's going on down there. And to say it feels good when you touch your vulva, we don't do it at Grandma's Thanksgiving table. <laughs> but, you know, that is a perfectly reasonable thing to say that both acknowledges the good feeling and also the sense that this is something personal and private mm-hmm. without without stigmatizing or shaming. Yeah. Um, so both pieces, I think, is important. Not just saying we do that in private because that. <laughs> And it is like, why? You yeah. know, so it's hard to say, but to acknowledge the good feelings or just like when my, I, I sat in on um, a puberty education class where the teacher who was teaching it, they were naming the parts of, you know, of the genitalia. And she said, this is the clitoris. It's for making good feelings. That's all you need to do for a 10 year old. You don't need to go into the whole situation, you know, you, but it's for making good feelings. That's what it's for. Wow. Boom. Right. And I thought, very good. And then later in that class, I this is actually at the end of the book, I was sitting behind these two boys. So they're two 10-year-old boys. And they had to, the, the kids were, di- they had a diagram and they had to fill in the blanks for the parts of the gen, you know, like the scrotum, the, you know, the penis, the whatever they were doing inside and outside. And so with the female, you know, it's the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, the vulva, the, I think the, maybe the labia, I don't remember what it was, but the clitoris was on there. And one of the boys, you know, said to the other one, you know, hey, what's this again? And the other one said, that's the clitoris. It's for making good feelings. And I thought, I want my daughter dating that boy. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Well, for at the risk of, you know, TMI, truly for the benefit of the listeners. So there were two experiences with my girl so far. So actually the 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 younger one, she was um, you know, my my husband kind of found her. Uh she was she loved just being in her diaper, prefers to be naked. And this was around two. And he just said, oh my gosh. And and he's more of a panicker. And then I just said, what? And he said, come over here. I'm going to walk away. And she had her diaper off and she had like, you know, a carabiner, like one of those like clips, um, sometimes your keychains. It was almost like our keychain. And she was just playing around down there. And I just said, just like you said, I said, oh, does that feel good? And, you know, and I said, that's okay. And I said, you know, and I did like take that away from her. And I said, you know, it's okay to use, you know, like use your hands or whatever and put her diaper on. She was really young. It was the only time, but I do feel like, again, like, you know, the older daughter was around and kids absorb environmental things. So that could have been a source of shame. And, and I, tried to mitigate it. And the other one was with my older one and it was it was before a bath, but she just had like that typical, I mean, very very small amount of like white stuff down there, you know, when you're building up the healthy bacteria and everything that's and she and she had noticed it and she just said and she was playing around and she just said, "You know, I don't like that white stuff." And I just said, "Oh, I said, you know, is there any re- reason why?" And she didn't have a reason. I said, "Well, you know, that it's normal. I said, you know, mommy has white stuff, you know, and just, we kind of left it at that. And, um, but I wanted her to know that like, this wasn't like poop you left on your butt that is, you know, you want to wipe an unhygienic, that it was a very normal thing. And, and I'm not saying that these are the easiest conversations to have, but 
I feel like by starting young, as they get older and it gets more complicated, I'm it's more I'm going to be more in the habit. And even if I don't like the need to have the conversation, I'm going to appreciate the outcome. Right. You know what it is? It's you're building a scaffolding. You're building a scaffolding that's going to be able to build a bridge to having conversations that if you start to ha- you can start to have them later, but it's more awkward. And there's this way that I think that when we talk about sex, we put it over in this silo, right? Like it's somehow different than all the other conversations we have with our children. When the fact is, is that we have the same, we we want to them, them to express the same values, right? We want our children to be caring, compassionate, kind, respectful, reciprocal. All of these issues are the same in their sexual education as they are in, in their other citizenship, you know? The way that they treat their friends and the way that they treat their classmates. So we have to make these bridges. So even things like, you know, when they're playing in the sandbox when they're little and somebody says, I don't, you know, don't, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, you respect that. Somebody says, no, you respect no. If your child, here's another thing for parents, you know, your child doesn't want to c- hug Aunt Nancy because she doesn't really know Aunt Nancy or whatever. You have to kind of suck up your embarrassment and say, you know what? She doesn't have to because that's her body. She doesn't, I am not allowed to force her to hug somebody against her will. That is a non-consensual experience. And your child needs to understand that their body is theirs and that their body is under their control and they're, you know, the ones who get to consent. That's not always easy. I mean, right now my daughter's going through a phase. So I have a 13 year old and I can't tell as many tales out of school as <laughs> I do at this point, but she is going through a thing right now where, you know, she, she's really conscious of her boundaries. And so she doesn't like it. Like I I reached over and I was petting her hair the other night and she just said, mom, you didn't ask me if you could do that. And of course she never asks me. She'll, and I don't, you know, she just hugs me or kisses me. She's very affectionate, but she has, and sometimes it's fine when I, you know, if I don't ask, but a lot, but now she, you know, it's that, that adolescent transition where she's figuring out physically and psychologically who she is. And she wants me to ask. And, and I want, I want, I mean, that one was a little, I thought really, but okay. But the thing that I had a hard time was, was that I was, she walked by and I kind of pat her on the tush and she just said, mom, don't do that. And it's that moment, you know, when you're, when you've got little ones, you're so connected to their bodies that you don't, I mean, originally you're totally, con- you know, they're inside of you and you, the, the whole growing up is a, is a, is a process of you no longer having access to that body in the same way. And so I've hit that point at adolescence where that's over, right? That is over. I do not have access to the body. I do not really see her naked. I don't, you know, and, and it's hard as a parent to remember, oh yeah, I don't get to slap her on the tush anytime I feel like it anymore. You know, she actually rankles. I mean, maybe another kid wouldn't, but she does. She's yeah. like, that's my space. And, um, and I've said, you know, look, I'm really sorry. And I've explained this to her. I'm used to, I've had your body as mm-hmm. part of me for so long. It's hard for me to remember. I'm not doing it to make you mad. And that's mm-hmm. eased it. But, but I do it to my husband too. I mean, it's just an affectionate gesture. And so I'm like, oh, stop that. Oh, stop that. But anyway, that, that whole issue of, of learning physical boundaries, learning your sense of control, learning consent is something that starts very young and in very, uh, those kinds of lessons, like you said, that they just absorb that aren't overt, that you're not saying this is what I'm doing, but you're demonstrating through your support of them, um, what your values are. Yeah. I think that's really important too, because it came to mind one of the stories in your book that, you know, with your daughter being able to set those boundaries, which I'm very big on personal boundaries too. And I think that comes with a strong sense of self-worth and self-esteem. So, you know, we, when we get too worried about, I don't want to hurt the other people's feelings or whatever, even outside the realm of sex, like someone's commenting on my food and I don't want to hurt their feelings. You know, I don't say, Hey, shut up. I don't want to talk to you about my eating choices, you know, but that definitely goes into the realm of sex. But in your book, you talked about the girl who was like just going with the flow and that it was just like, yeah, that's not like, I want girls to be able to set a boundary and not feel like, Oh, if they say no, or if they put their foot down or get, try to get themselves out of a situation, you know, that there's no benefit to going with the flow, you know? Right. And it's both ways. I mean, it's both in terms of setting boundaries for the negative and also for the positive. So, you know, one of the things that I talk about is Alvernacchio's metaphor about sex being like a pizza that, you know, you decide rather than a baseball, you know, rather than the, you know, the, running the bases thing, the baseball, 
that because that's a very that sets score. That's Did you score? <laughs> right, it's an adversarial metaphor. Girls are the supposed to be the opposing team that you're supposed to be scoring against, and it sets up girls' limits as a challenge that boys are supposed to overcome. So pizza, you're, you know, I, I realize there's <laughs> there's eating issues around it, but just theoretically, you know, that that you're it's a shared experience. You know, you 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 decide whether you want to go out to pizza. You negotiate toppings. If you want pepperoni and I want mushrooms, maybe we go halvesies, or maybe you know we have pepperoni this time, mushrooms next time. Or if you keep insisting on pepperoni and I'm a vegetarian, I won't go out to pizza with you anymore. You know, it's 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 a very we when we when we go to eat with somebody, we think about the other person's well being. We think about it's an equal experience. You wouldn't shove pizza down somebody's throat, but. I added to that metaphor a sort of girls only piece, which is about that going along to get along. Because since girls will sort of in a relationship say, yeah, whatever you want, or, you know, they'll silence or suppress or, or subvert their own needs. I'll say, look, girls, if you don't negotiate your toppings on your pizza, you're going to end up with green peppers and nobody wants green peppers on their pizza. So you know, so I mean, you have to, it's not just asserting your boundaries so that you don't get bowled over with somebody, you know, breaching your boundaries, but also so that you can assert your wants, needs, desires, as well as your limits. Yeah, that's so important. So I want to talk a little bit more about um, intersections between body image and sexual health. And I think we touched on it in the beginning, this idea that it makes sense if we're having difficulty you know, I mean, even being body neutral, I mean, these days it's tough for people to just accept this is my body, you know, because they still want to change it, you know, but even if we can get to body neutrality, it's very difficult to want to bring pleasure to something that you hate or that you're having difficulty with. Right. And that's absolutely true. The research absolutely shows that, that these issues of self-objectification that um, are linked to negative body image, eating disorders, body monitoring, you know, self-harm, depression, all of these are also, I mean, this is a real bait and switch, right? Self-objectification. So this idea that you're seeing yourself as this, you know, assemblage of parts or as to be judged by others or that you're constantly thinking, am I hot enough? Am I sexy enough? You know, all of these things is actually negatively linked to sexual satisfaction. So the more you're, you're kind of, it's linked to body monitoring during sex. And it's linked to this thing that they call uh, spectatoring, which is this idea that during sex, you're always watching yourself from the outside, kind of watching, like, is my arm here? Does my arm look good? What about, you know, the bat wings? What, you know, and when you're focused on that, you, it's certainly hard to focus on an embodied sense of sexuality. And one of the things that um, Emily Nagoski suggests, which I really love, is that she, she says, and I guess there's evidence to back this up, that this is helpful. That if you stand in front of your mirror as, and this is, she talks about this in, your te- in her TED Talk, so I, again, I, I really recommend that. Um, you stand in front of your mirror as naked as you can stand to be, and you write down everything you like about yourself, what, of what you see, even if it's like your eyelash. I mean, like, and if you can't find anything, then, you know, think about the door in your mind that's blocking you from seeing anything and how that door might be open. But Write something down. Do that every single day for, I can't remember how long she says, and it actually increases, you know, it does a little bit of mind shifting. So instead of always seeing, looking in the mirror and seeing, ugh, my thighs, my stomach, my nose, my ears, whatever, you're seeing, hmm, I like those eyelashes. I kind of like that Cupid's bow mouth I've got going on there, you know, and it, it just allows you to get more towards a positive kinder view of your body kindness view towards yourself um, that apparently based on evidence will improve your sexual well-being. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. And I could definitely see that working. It's interesting because it relates to one of one of the reader questions that came up, is, which is when I'm most upset about my body, sex is the last thing I turn to. How can we use sex as a therapeutic tool when dealing with poor body image. And so I'm not thinking like fake it till you make it because that to me means more disconnect. But is there a way that almost like taking, you know, acknowledging you have a poor body image, but having sex or masturbating anyway that might then help enhance your body image? Or what are your thoughts on on that type of question? Well, I can't really speak to a therapeutic context. I'm not a therapist. 
But, you know, I do think, like I said, I think that that idea that Emily brought up is a really good one. How can we mind, you know, a kind of mindful pleasure in our bodies? I don't think just having sex, especially if it, you know, if it's triggering all those negative feelings about your body is necessarily going to be that useful. But, you know, I I always will say like with, with little ones that just making them conscious of physical pleasure, like even stroking your arm and thinking about trying to just stop and, you know, close your eyes and feel good about that pleasure that it feels in stroking your arm is a way to be in your body a little more. I think that anything that helps us embody a little more yoga um, mindfulness, all these things, which are, which I think are used in a therapeutic context for people with negative body image or eating disorders, anything that will help us feel good about our body. If you, if you can, you know, not just masturbate, I think, but sort of, as I'm talking to you, I'm like touching my arms and touching my legs, you know, do something more focused on feeling nice within your body, feeling pleasure within your body, feeling cared for in your body. I think that that helps move the dial a little bit on, on both of those issues. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And all those ideas I think would be very, very helpful. Is there anything else that you think, you know, I feel like we've covered so much. I, I got questions about, well, what if a family is a religious family and like believes that you don't have sex until marriage, you know, can you still teach about this is how your body works or, you know, like kind of like gray areas like that? Well, I don't think that, I mean, you know, at the end of the book, I talk about a classroom in which I'm following around a teacher who, she doesn't use words like good and bad choices or healthy and unhealthy choices because she serves a community that has a broad range of values around these issues. So what she says is that she wants to help her students make as many choices as possible that end in joy and honor rather than shame and regret. And that construct works whether you are a family that believes that children should remain abstinent until marriage or a fan or, you know, a girl, a child, male or female, a student who like goes up and hooks up every, goes out and hooks up with a different partner every weekend. What, I mean, my, I'll tell you, my mother, um, my parents told me that you do not become sexually active until after marriage when I was growing up. But at the same time, my mother, bless her heart, was <laughs> constantly telling me um, how great her sex life with my dad was. And, and I would plug my ears and go, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to. Oh, yuck, 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 yuck. But at the same time, I did hear what she was trying to tell me. So the, I didn't see those values growing up as in conflict. The idea that you could simultaneously tell a child that this was something that ethically and in terms of your personal value, oops, I, I think that you can be a family that ethically and in terms of your values can tell it, you know, can communicate these beliefs while also saying that sex is something wonderful, that it should feel good, that this is how that works, that giving and taking and mutuality and reciprocity and, and respect and compassion and um, pleasure within that relationship are important. I mean, as I know that I mean, I'm, I'm Jewish and in the Jewish faith, that's very clear. I mean, that, that one of the few reasons in Orthodox Judaism that a woman can divorce a man in tradition, you know, very traditional culture is because he's not satisfying her sexually. That is actually a legit reason. Abstinence until marriage education is ineffective. According to all of the research, not only do kids not he becomes sexually active. They also, they have higher rates of oral sex, higher rates of anal sex, just as many partners, but they're more likely to become pregnant or contract disease because somehow they jettison the no sex till marriage message, but they hang on to the message that, um, I don't know, somehow you don't use birth control or disease protection. So it has been an ineffective message, you know, from, from a, um, a public health perspective um, to communicate to children. So I don't know, you know, within a particular family that may be different, I don't know, but in terms of a public health message, in terms of sex education in schools, in terms of a kind of overarching message, communicating something very different, as we saw with the Dutch, is uh, a much better idea. Well, it's been a very good and interesting and very helpful conversation um, today for me personally. And I know for the listeners who are, you know, really just struggling with this idea of, I like how you said, um, you know, it really becomes a question of who has a right to engage 
in um, sex and masturbation and feeling good and and who gets to enjoy it. And it, it, it sounds like there is more engagement in younger people, but girls don't necessarily have permission to enjoy. And that is something that, you know, even if we don't have kids, if that's going on with us as adults, like that is a problem that we can solve. I actually read Emily Nagoski's book. It finally gave me permission. And I like brought my husband and we went to like a legitimate like sex and communication education class, you know, (laughs) you know, and it was it was good. And it was it really kind of to me, I felt like was necessary to have, um, you know, like, okay, I'm married, like, let's go and do this together, you know? And like, we went downstairs and looked at vibrators together and we picked up some oils or whatever. And just, and yeah, it was like, this is something we can do together. And it's not because you're not good enough or it's not because I'm broken. It was more like, why not? You know, it was like, why the hell not? And so, so it ended up becoming a story in, in, in body kindness where it was just kind of like, yeah, we were in a, in a dry spell. And, and I didn't think it was just because we had young kids, although that is a big, uh, barrier, but you know, there was something more. And so I feel like, you know, this is, yes, I could shy away from it or I could, you know, bring some people on who, deal with and understand sex and sexuality and can just encourage people that this may be what helps you with your own body image. It may be what helps you just realize that there's more things to life than what size pants you're wearing. And and it can help you in so many other ways. So I'm really grateful that we had this conversation. I would love to just kind of back and forth, kind of sum up like For parents of young kids, what are a few kind of key things they should do? Well, again, you know, I would say naming the body parts, not shaming children around masturbation, but saying things like, you know, it feels really good when you touch your vulva, naming that body part, Mm -hmm. but we don't do it. You know, we do that in our rooms or in the, you know, whatever. Uh, There's a great book. Well, I'm going to actually give you two resources that I think are terrific for parents of young kids of, you know, meaning um, zero to puberty. One is for parents. It's called From Diapers to Dating, Mm -hmm. From Diapers to Dating. Um, And it's written by um, a Unitarian minister, a former Unitarian minister, because Unitarians do the best sex ed, the best. They're like a little piece of Holland in America. (laughs) It's our whole life's curriculum. It goes from five to like, I think, into your 60s. And it's spectacular. And she was also the uh, the president of the Sexual Information Education Council. I can't remember what psychus is is of the U.S. Um, And it, it looks at talking to your child and thinking about your child in terms of sexuality from infancy through puberty and it looks at it from a developmental perspective so so it really puts a lot weaves in a lot of developmental psychology which is really interesting because mm. it turns out when your 3 year old asks where did i come from they may not mean what you think they mean mm. so to understand all of that is really critical also another great book for parents of of i, I think for little ones too but also for parents of like slightly older kids is um, Talk to Me First by Deborah Rothman. That's really mm. a gold standard book. For children themselves, it's really good to have around the house, like you should be getting this now, Rebecca, mm-hmm. the books of um, by Roby, R-O-B-I-E, Harris. Um, they're called, they, they, they go, they're from four, they, they're from, for children from about four to 12. And they're called things like, um, it's so amazing. It's not the stork. It's perfectly normal. And I can't remember which ones are for which ages, but it's really great to have those in the house because when your child is sitting at the dinner table, mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. mine was, um, when they're you know six or something, and suddenly the fork stops halfway from the mouth to the mouth, and they get that sort of you know dreamy look, and she says something like, "So I understand about the sperm and the egg, but how does the sperm get from the penis into the vagina, mom?" And your husband gives you that like mm, look. Um, you you can um, say, you know, honey, that's a great question. After we eat dinner, let's go read your book and and look at that. Um, and you will have that at the ready instead of going, oh 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 oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. You know, so you need to be on top of it. You need to be a little bit ahead so that those questions are natural. So that those bridges, can, that scaffolding can be built. So those bridges are there. So those are some really concrete ideas. 
cool. I appreciate that. And then with teens, it sounded like, so you, you've, you talked about the body parts as re- reinforcement, but the big thing there is it's, it's conversing at all. But when you converse, not just risk, but about the joy piece of it and, you know, that it's choosing pizza toppings, a mutual respect, um, or, or I guess with the layer of your family has your own family values, but you can still educate beyond, you know, risks and, and kind of let that be in your family unit, what you decide to do. Anything else crucial in like the teen years? Yeah. So for for puberty, I would say there's a great website called amaze.org that's new um, that that handles all of those issues and handles um, talking about sexuality for younger kids. There's also the book uh, Dating Smarts is very good. For high school kids um, and college kids, I recommend um, Heather Karina uh, wrote a book called SEX, something like an all you can use progressive guide to, I don't know, something, mm-hmm. but um, SEX. And mm-hmm. she also r- runs the website Scarlet Teen, mm-hmm. um, which is, it will answer any questions. And that, those are more progressive. I, I don't know that they're geared towards families so much that expect their children to remain abstinent, but mm-hmm. um, they're both really great resources for kids. Talk to, Talk to Me First is a great, again, that mm-hmm. book is for adults. There's some looking at things like consent is like a cup of tea or this is your brain on porn. You know, those are very good. Uh, uh, those are both videos that are really, you know, meet kids where they're at in the video world. Those are really great videos to combat some of these things. So, and I think, you know, what I always say is a book, I wrote this book in part to open a dialogue between parents and, and girls and boys. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I have, you know, it's, it's, it has a tremendous readership. It's turned out among high school girls and college girls. Yeah. And yeah. it opens those doors of conversation with parents to sit, be able to say, what's going on in your world around these issues? Like I, she's saying this is going on in this book. It's like a safe space yeah. to talk about it without having to say, so are you enjoying your sex life? With me? <laughs> so, so, do, you know, reading that together or watching the Ted talk together that I did or trapping your child in the car when you happen to be listening to the fresh air podcast that I'm on or something is a way to open that door to conversation. If your child is a teen now and you haven't had those conversations um, to, you know, like when I'm talking about the hookup culture in those talks, mm-hmm. not the tech, I don't think I do, but in, in, in the book and in the fresh air podcast, you know, is that true in your school? What's it like? What's it been like for you? What do you think? What do you think about, you know, what she's saying about oral sex here? It's a way to just talk about it that takes it a little bit out of themselves. So it's a little less awkward for them. Yeah. I mean, that's a great idea. And, and I would add just, I'm not a therapist, but I do a lot of behavioral counseling. I work with a lot of therapists with clients and stuff. And we will often talk about just the power of opening up a conversation and that it, you're right. It opens the door. You might get squeams and whatever, and don't talk to me about that, but it's opened a door and doesn't have to turn into like a battle. It's more of an invitation. You can be consistent in your willingness to engage in conversation about it. And you never know when all of a sudden, you know, the fish is going to bite, so to speak, you know, because the door has been open. So you haven't failed as a parent if you both feel awkward and they went running in the other room, you know, it's not yet. So you just, you keep trying and you, you do get to decide that this is important to me and is part of my job and this doesn't need to become a, a battle, right? But as a parent, I've got to be consistent with my willingness to work on this because I may be making an impact that they don't even see. Right. And we don't get to choose to not parent because it makes us feel embarrassed. You know, you got to go for it. And yeah, it may have an impact that they don't see. And it also, um, frankly, will enhance your relationship to break through that taboo and basically present yourself to your child and say, here I am. I am on your side. I'm willing to have a conversation about these things. You can basically talk to me about anything and I'm not going to flinch. Mm-hmm. That's important. Well, it has been so great. I really appreciate it. I'm going to share. I definitely recommend your books and the um, TED Talk. I haven't heard about Fresh Air, but I'll find that and make sure that's included in the show notes. Where can people kind of follow you, stay on top of everything you're doing so they're always on top of what you have next? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, I've got my 
Facebook author page and my little Twitter account, like everybody, a website, you know, on PeggyOrnstein.com. I'm working on a book on boys now. That's what I'm doing next. Yay! I was wondering if you were going to say something. So, yeah. so is it, is it, it, when will it be out? Is it similar to girls and sex, but just with the other gender or what, what should we expect? Yes. And don't push me on when it's going to be. Ah. <laughs> what you, my editor? No. Um, yeah. It, you know, it'll probably be out. Mm, my guess is like 2020. Okay, cool. Very cool. Wow. Well, it can't come soon enough. Thank you so, so much for being a guest on today's show and for all the work you do. You know, I know you, I'm sure you get feedback and fan emails and all that, but just know that for everyone you hear, there's probably thousands of people you're helping and making a difference in their life that, that you never hear from. And that's it's very meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And that's our show. The podcast is made possible with support from listeners. Please donate to help offset production costs at gofundme.com slash bodykindness. And please rate and review the show when you have a moment. It really matters. Let's keep the conversations going on Facebook. Search Body Kindness and request to join the group for Body Kindness readers and listeners. Have a question for us to answer on a future episode? Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash question. Body Kindness books and audiobooks are available wherever books are sold. To request a signed print copy, visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order. For other questions about this podcast, please email info at bodykindnessbook.com. 